Rock and roll. Hello, everyone. Uh, Tom Barry here, Professor Barry. Uh, this is week one. Uh, this is going to be the week where we just kind of start diving in to what is sociology, what are its applications to this area of deviance. Really interesting uh, to examine deviance because what we're doing is we're examining society itself, society, culture, people, institutions, all kinds of uh, interesting facets come out when we um, study and examine deviance. Um, let me, before we get started today, just kind of go over the requirements, uh, just so you know kind of how to prepare for, for the assignment, uh, for these assignments. So let me, um, actually I'm gonna pause here for a second. All right, here we go. So the weekly assignment, this is in, I think it's in week, zero folder, maybe a week one folder as well. Just go back and re just go back and re review it. Uh, just kind of talks about the assignment, the, you know, late policy, if it's, if it's turned in after the assigned due date. Remember, these are always due the, by the night before our class meeting. And that's really important uh, because this way it ensures that you are the most well-prepared for class, that you've gone through the articles, the lecture, immerse yourself in that information. And then when we get to class, we can have, spend more time just kind of processing and applying. So I think it works out really well that way. Um, so here's the format. You got one section where you review the readings, podcast, any other supplemental information. And then you have the summary of the lecture themes. So this is where we're at. We're at the lecture theme part right now. I suggest just for time considerations to schedule yourself. Maybe do one day, do one part of it the next day, another part, spread it out a little bit. It's not, doesn't involve too much time, but it definitely takes some time to go through the information. Think we're meeting once a week. So think about it as like one of the class meetings that, you know, you're kind of doing this kind of other stuff that's going on. All right, I need to pull up another document as well. Let me kind of go there. Let me go to... All right, so for the first week, for this is in week one folder, right? Um, for the most part, I'll put down these reading prompts for the readings or the podcast or video, whatever it may be. Sometimes it'll be more general. Um, so every week will be different, but there'll be a file in every weekly folder that says, hey, here's week, week one assignment, week two, et cetera. So for week one assignment, you basically go through, summarize ideas from the main theories, explain the value of using theory in the social world. That's from the column article. All of the readings are in the weekly folder. And then this is the information from the textbook, uh, just some seven different questions um, to respond to. And then summarize the lecture themes. And it can get a little bit challenging. There's a lot of information when I, that I present. And what I'm looking for in your themes is that you're communicating your, in your themes. As you've identified the main, main ideas, perspective, kind of think the 10,000 foot view that you're summarizing um, a lot of information, but trying to get sort of the big picture piece. As, and then when you're doing that, you're bringing in some specific information to support that. So don't feel like you need to cover everything that's addressed in the lecture, it's impossible. You're looking for extracting main themes and ideas or things that are being like, you know, that 10,000 foot view and being able to communicate that uh, and include specific information along the way. It may take you a couple weeks to get it figured out. I'm here to support you. So if you're like, man, this is just a struggle for me, let me know. I can help you strategize, figure it out. Uh, once you get the ball rolling, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't try to make things trickier, or make it difficult, make it hard. Just make it, but try to make things helpful and informative and useful uh, for learning the content of the class. All right, so let's jump in then to the lecture for the week. Let's see. All right, so we're going to start off here. This, okay, so we already did this, we already reviewed. This. So I put these lecture, these lecture notes out there in, you know, as well in the weekly folder. So you see all the PowerPoint stuff out there if you want to follow through that way. But there's just sort of review the assignment. We already talked about that. Um, what is Deviant? Why the I man? It's like what is deviant? That's like that's you know we could define it real succinctly and say it's a violation of norms, but then we just can get really tricky really quick. Who establishes the norm? Um, what are the influences on the norm? Uh, does everyone who violate the norm get treated in the same way? What are the different responses? Uh, so it's going to get 
murky the waters. We're going to see a lot of different aspects that, that defining deviance and explaining deviance, and then sort of understanding it from sociologically. We're going to sort of really expand our views of what is deviance. And I think it's valuable and helpful because it helps us provide a better understanding of social forces and society itself. So let's start with an overview of like, okay, well, what is social, what are the social sciences and how does sociology fit within it? We can look at social sciences as a, encapsulates a lot of different disciplines. Anthropology, the study of culture and people. History, of course, you know, self-explanatory, right? The events of the past, the, the, the events in contemporary life, using history to be, basically understand uh, the world. Economics, it's a behavioral science. Oftentimes we put it economics, we think about business and there are definitely a huge application there. Uh, the core of economics, it is a behavioral science. It's kind of interesting to know this is a longer conversation not to have here, but economics really got appropriated into or moved into like this sort of business enterprise and that kind of fit with our economic development or economic development around the world. The foundations of economics are not, uh, have moved far from what it was original focus, but it's basically a behavioral science I'm trying to understand how people make choices, why they make the choices that, that they do. Another social science is geography. Thinking about cultural geography may be the easiest one to sort of think about. Think about how patterns of behavior change across place, across region. Think about the distribution of, let's say, obesity in the United States. Looking at the geographic kind of layout of that and sort of ask questions about why do we see patterns of obesity in different places around the United States or around the world. Psychology, right? To get into the neuropsych level, to mind, you know, sort of the neuropsych. Uh, all the way, so that's very micro, micro to social psychology, um, individuals and groups, social forces kind of enter, enter into that as well. And then sociology, which really draws upon, I would say, all of these disciplines in a way, um, but it's looking at, as we will define, sociology is this systematic study of society, and we're looking at all the way from the macro level, all the way down to the micro level. So social science as well, what's the point of all this work. Part of, I mean, it's about trying to understand the human experience. Humanities is, you know, this is also the same way, right? Philosophy, um, art history. It's really about understanding the human experience. Um, and we have to study society in order to understand the human experience. Um, you think about even things like mindfulness um, as a concept, as an idea, as a practice to understand mindfulness, I think, requires engagement with uh, culture history and things like that. So why do we study it? Well, part of it may be an influence of the age of reason, the age of enlightenment from the Western viewpoint, but it's not only a Western experience, it's a, it's a global experience that transcends time and place. Uh, it's the desire to know. Um, one, thing that, one thing that's helpful too, if we know the past, we can better understand the present. Uh, we look at COVID-19, for example, and sort of the different responses and sort of, you know, just the different, different perspectives on, you know, mask mandates, for example, or vaccination, public fear, concern, public response, um, all that kind of stuff, you know, we make historical comparisons to the outbreak of, of, uh, of influenza in different time periods in American history. You can look at it from a global perspective and look at variability across place. All these things help us to better understand uh, what's going on in our own backyard, um, in our own time. Part of it, we study human experience so that we can adapt systems to be more effective, to be more equitable, to be more democratic. So part of it is to identify, to study in order to make remedies or suggestions for change. A lot of the social sciences came about or really expanded, I should say, 1700s, 1800s, with the development of urbanization, industrialization, movement of people, social problems start to develop, and it becomes a sort of focus on trying to understand all these dramatic changes that were going on and how we can use science, analysis, rational thought to ba basically better understand so we can be better prepared to make um, adjustments. <clears throat> Sociology is the systematic study of society, so it's an academic discipline. It's a little bit of philosophy, though. You go into, it's, it's, you go into certain disciplines like, okay, psychology, you get into the neuropsych level. It's gonna be much more uh, focused on empirical, uh, empirical findings. Um, things may be more, more likely to use the experimental design in terms of conditions of research methods. 
Sociology has roots in quantitative work, qualitative work, um, theoretical foundations. So it's much more, so it's systematic. Um, and that's important. Um, so we're trying to remove sociologists or anyone in sort of academic work, tries to understand their own value belief positions. And, and when they're evaluating something is try to be value neutral or not to impose values in interpreting the social world. So we have to be more pragmatic and systematic in evaluating and understanding society itself. And this gets tricky. So in thinking about things like homelessness in the United States or in our own, you know, in our community, one has, one has to maybe sometimes suspend their own cultural and social judgments and be able to understand things more systematically to be able to evaluate and understand that particular social problem in a more clear fashion. And that's just challenging because sometimes we're not aware of our blind spots. We're not aware of what we don't know. We're not aware of our biases that we bring forward in terms of our evaluation. Um, so we look at in sociology that relationship between the micro level to the macro level, individuals, groups, community, all the way up to society itself and major institution structures and culture. Um, always thinking about context, how context shaped the human experience, whether that's a cultural context, an economic or historical context. So being able to understand things within those contexts. And as I mentioned before, you know, the dis academic disciplines in social science is really advanced with urbanization and industrialization. And I'd say, you know, sociology has its roots in that time period because a lot of stuff was going on in terms of rising crime, poverty, social issues in urban environments. And the focus was on how do we systematically study this stuff in order to provide um, social reforms. So there's a long history of sociology as a discipline that's involved in public policy. So one thing that's important, this will come through out the term kind of work with this is understanding the relationship between the individual and social forces. And it's difficult because in our culture, we focus a lot on the individual, individual responsibility, individual accountability, individual, uh, it's the individuals who determine their fate and their future. And when we do that, we discount um, or minimize sometimes the degree of influence of the structure or of the social forces themselves. So what we're trying to do is like trying to untangle those things. They're, they're forever entangled. They're difficult to pull apart. At the same time, we as a culture tend to privilege the individual side and social sciences and sociology specifically tend to encourage the examination of those social forces that impact the human experience. So there's different ways of understanding the relationship between the individual and social forces. One of them is sort of a common sense, what we come to know, uh, but our common sense may be off, may not be accurate. So for example, using my 201 class say that it's common sense, that may, common sense, a commonly held belief that males are just better at math, like it's a biologically determined thing. Well, that common sense is not empirically true. It's not rational. It's not, it's not validated by, by science. Um, there's a lot of cultural and social forces that are going on that are shaping math outcomes uh, from grade school, middle school, high school, all the way through college. So common sense may not be so common, may, may, may be wrong. Um, these are part of our blinders sometimes. What we think is true may not actually be true. Um, so we approach things in social sciences or in academia in general is try to be more empirically focused, so research trying to more objectively understand the world. And sometimes that empirical focus sometimes contradicts our common sense, our, our maybe deeply held values and beliefs and ideals. And this becomes a challenge, right? So talk about all the social forces behind the influence of social class position and start to bring into these things into a discussion. I know I'm gonna get a response from, from a significant percentage of individuals who will resist engaging in discussions about those social forces because part of our culture deeply trains us to see that a person's class position is determined by their effort. And it's always trying to understand to not minimize the, the influence of effort, but put effort in perspective. And that can be hard to do because we have to start to look at things more analytically, which may challenge our own cultural assumptions. And sometimes there's, there's valid crit critique of 
sociology, valid critique of any academic work, valid critique of capitalism, valid critique of anything, right? But sometimes when we when there's been a critique of science, and it's just done sort of like as an indiscriminatory sort of thing, and I could just like it's just without a lot of real deep analytical thought to that, just like science is critiqued and viewed as, as being de delegitimate. I think that what that does is it's a reactionary element. It, it serves to protect something. Um, and so we need to be mindful of, I think, aware of, of critique anything, but at the same time, we're in a culture that sometimes critiques empirical work for political other reasons for that. An example of this could be like, Income inequality and teenage pregnancy, those two are strongly correlated. Um, we see teenage pregnancy maybe as an individual thing, right? Individuals making a decision. It's the individual's fault. And I would say it's, well, the individual made a decision. There's no doubt there's an individual factor there going on, but there's also social forces that are in operation as well. Countries with lower income, income inequality tend to have less teenage pregnancy. So it raises a question, what is that relationship? There are social forces in operation. So let's understand those rather than focusing only on the individual. Another way of looking at this relationship is looking at it as, we'll talk about this in class as well when we meet, is that on the one end you have free will, individual making choices without an influence of the context for their social position. So it's just like individual agency. And then you have determinism. We'll talk about social determinism so that the environment or social forces determines a person's outcome. So free will, everybody can achieve any class position they want. Determinism, the class you're born into is the class you will stay in. Well, neither one of those are accurate. Um, it's self-determination, the individual making choices within a context and the choices that individuals make are shaped by their status, their race, class, age, uh, their social position, as well as the consequences for their choices are influenced by that status positions as well. So not everybody has the same choices. Um, not everybody has the same supports. Uh, not everybody is subjected to the same controls. All those things are addressed with self-determination. Individuals making choices within context, different individuals, different choices uh, may be available to them and different consequences. The United States, we tend to be focused on the free will side of things. So it's this encouragement of social sciences is helping us move into understanding that self-determinism kind of component. This little diagram here kind of gets at a little bit about, oops, about that self-determinism. One way to see it is like very micro level, very free will. But let's kind of move outside that, start to think about all these different influences that shape uh, the human experience. So if you look at some of the stuff and we look at it, apply it to deviance, we could say that within our culture, we tend to focus on individual things. Say that individual, like violent crime, it's just you know the bad individual kind of thing. Um, we look at whatever it might be, we look at it through that individual lens. Well, I think what's really difficult sometimes, but also really important is to say, the individual is accountable for their actions. At the same time, there's a social responsibility as well. So somebody commits a crime, they are subjected to the law and they are responsible, you know, they, they have responsibility to the community and to the state. So they have to serve their time, whatever that might be. At the same time, it, there's an under, we have to have an understanding of what are the social forces that are going on that are shaping that and influencing that. Um, if we get too focused on only the individual aspect of it, we're never gonna be in a position where we're trying to ad address the structural realities in which people, we all live. Um, and I would argue by focusing on the individual alone, it's helping to protect those structures themselves. So rather than redesigning structures, we focus on just the individual. So individuals are always accountable. There's never, I mean, individuals are always making choices. It makes me think about, for example, a, a book called uh, A Man's Search for Meaning written by Viktor Frankl. He was uh, in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. He was a psychiatrist by trade. And one thing he recognized that individuals in that environment who survived the, the best mentally as well as physically were those who saw that they still made a choice, even though they're in the system of, um, of incredible control, dehumanizing environment, uh, brutal, brutal physical conditions, that, in, that 
those who are, who are in the concentration camps who viewed that they still made choices, treat, choices in how they treated each other, how they treated the guards, um, how they engaged in sort of day-to-day -day life, like if they, that you couldn't take away, if they believed you can't take away my agency, my humanity of who I am, those were the individuals who were much more likely to survive. So we, we are always have a choice, but we also are choices, context matters. All right, so let's move on to theme, num theme number two. And when you're doing these, again, these teams has a lot of information, right? So it's like, man, how do I put all that into the 75 to 125, I think was what the number of words. It's getting the main spirit, right? What are the main, the main idea, the main spirit, the main perspective, and then incorporating a couple little pieces of information from the lecture into that to convey, just to provide a little bit more depth of information. All right, theme number two. So now we move into uh, the sociological imagination, which came from C. Wright Mills. And this is kind of like the call of sociology, 1950s, 1960s. I think it was 1960, know, early 60s, he wrote this. Um, and I'll just kind of pull out a couple of different things from it. One is that what Mills was arguing or providing was this idea that our, our own personal bi biography is linked up to history. So to understand myself, for example, as a gendered individual, we all have a gender identity. Uh, my own, everybody has a personal journey with gender and that, that journey is shaped by history and social context. So part of his perspective of the sociological imagination is to develop a more rich understanding of oneself, one needs to be engaged with understanding history, culture, and social forces. I mean, it's not only about understanding the outside world, it's also about better understanding, um, you know, oneself. And then he makes this sort of distinction between private troubles and public issues. And the example that he uses, and I can't remember the number, it's something like if 10,000 people are unemployed or if one person's unemployed, it's a private trouble. A person is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, a person is suffering from, from a particular condition, a person is homeless. Those are all private troubles, but it's linked up to a larger public issue. So if 10,000 people are, are unemployed, it's no longer just a private trouble, it's a public issue. And the encouragement here is to get us to start thinking about the public issue component of it um, more than focused on just the individuals. Um, so it moves our attention and our focus to understanding structural, social kind of conditions. Part of this is empathy. Um, there's two different types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, which is based on analysis and information, um, based on understanding from a more cognitive place. And then there's affective emotional empathy. When I'm focused on empathy here, it's like that cognitive empathy. And empathy is the ability to understand. And I would argue that empathy is actually really radical um, because by engaging in empathy and understanding, um, we, we go from maybe dehumanizing a group to humanizing that group. And then we have to be in a position to, well, how do we respond to that now that we've humanized that particular group? So empathy is objective level understanding. I think if individuals over align themselves with a group and they're not able to see as clear some of the challenge, you know, some of the, the darker sides of that group and stuff like that, they're losing their ability to be empathic. Empathy is based on rational uh, cognitive thought process. So even, I put it here that even without personal contact, contact or information, people can develop views of others. Depending on the group, these social views may be distorted that leads into errors in thinking. And an example I provide when I worked in social work, a uh, clinical social worker for a period of time, you know, before I started that work, I mean, um, you know, I had ideas about people who were involved in the criminal justice system. Um, for one year, I worked with individuals trying to tra help them transition from uh, being in prison to, uh, to the outside world. So finding jobs, employment, uh, finding housing, getting connected up their, their parole, or parole officer, all these different kinds of things. So that experience led to a lot of different understandings of people who, are, people who were, uh, had been incarcerated. Um, these ideas, sometimes that we have about populations don't um, you know, the ones that I had prior to that work didn't come from conversations I had with people who were involved in the criminal justice system. It came from culture, right? And my social groups and orientation. And, and as a result, a lot of that was led to misunderstanding. So the, it's like 
it's challenging to how to properly understand somebody else, even somebody you're so intimately that you know, that you come across day to day, a family member, a loved one, right? To really know, to really have empathy is to really have this sort of imagination, to understand, objectively understand. And it takes, I guess that's sociological imagination to be able to do that, right? To be able to, to understand social forces in some degree. Uh, so really, I think, uh, so Michael Sandel, University, Harvard University, um, I don't know what department he is in, political science maybe. Um, interesting podcast, he has an interesting work, I can get this book. It's an interesting, uh, book is called Justice uh, by Michael Sandel, What's the Right Thing to Do? Just kind of walking through. This is actually based on a course that he teaches. Uh, he has a podcast called The Marriage Trap, I think is really interesting. And it really kind of, I think if you know, so this idea of merit, so that your hard work, this idea as a cultural viewpoint, your hard work, it determines your class position kind of thing. And he provides a really well-reasoned, analytical, empirical viewpoint that Meritocracy is a myth. Individual agency matters. And he focuses on that relationship between individual and a lot of other factors that are outside of that. To get there to that place requires to step away from our cultural, kind of like our cultural um, training, so to speak, because we are deeply entrenched in this idea of merit. Um, and I think you listen to something like, you know, Michael Sandel, I encourage you. Um, to listen to that podcast, go, huh, this is really interesting. It's like really unpackaging and thinking about what are, what are the ways we can think about um, social class or whatever social issue it may be. And thinking about things from, from these other vantage points away from only the individual, but honoring the individual achievement at the same time. So being able to do all of that. Okay, so theme three. So we have our, let's talk about social theory. Theories are perspectives that, that, that uh, we use to look at the world. So each theory has its own language system, has language systems that shape and influence the way that we view the world. Um, they have different values maybe embedded in them or different perspectives that are about them. They're different lenses. You think about, about lenses that you put on to look at the social world. Each of the theories take us to a different place. We can examine a social issue through the lens of each theory. Um, you know, psychology is like this too, right? Developmental psychology, for example, how many theories there are there on, on human development? There, there are a lot, right? Each of them adds to it versus it's not a subtraction thing. It's not that one's right or one's wrong. They're different. They have different, uh, different focus. There's a different rationale for each theory. There's a different perspective offered with each theory. You don't need to know this. I'm just putting this out here to go, look, like these theories, there's a lot of them we're talking about two macro level theories in this class, which are functionalism and conflict theory. And we're talking about interactionism, one of the micro level theories. If you go on in sociology or social sciences, you're gonna get, you know, or social science, sociology, you're gonna get, there's a lot more theories that are underneath this. We're using the three main branches of theory to get into the subject of deviance. I encourage you uh, to watch this video. It's a quick overview of, of the theories, the main theories in sociology. The Colony article that you're reading also goes through these theories. Um, and this is from the Khan Academy, I believe, K-H-A-N. There's a lot of videos out there, three sociological theories uh, you can find that'll walk you through them. So I encourage you to, to kind of do that. Uh, it's always good to hear other people kind of explain things. All right, let's kind of move into the theories here. I'll kind of, kind of go through them fairly quickly and we'll spend a little bit more time in class. So the first, before we get into the enlightenment, the age of reason, societies are already thinking about, you know, what makes people do bad stuff. Um, there's a period of time during mid, the Middle Ages where this view of that people were possessed, so the demonic perspective. So that goes way back, and there actually, there's a period, there was a period of time where they, they believe that individuals believe that um, people were being possessed by evil spirits. So this is the Middle Ages, and one way to remedy that was to drill a hole through the human skull to release the evil spirits. That practice was called trepanation and that, hap trepanation, and that happened in different cultures in different places. Okay, that's pre-science or pre-empirical uh, you know, empirical investigation. Then we get into the biological perspectives of crime, which came about with enlightenment, 1800s, Cesar Lombroso, uh, Italian uh, physicist who comes up with this 
idea that people are born biologically, there's a biological criminal mind kind of thing. It was kind of scientific, but it's pseudoscience. Um, maybe we'll kind of investigate that, talk about that a little bit more, but I just want to provide a little bit of kind of a little bit of historical backdrop that, you know, that took a while for, for, um, you know, to develop these more systematic ways of thinking about deviance and crime. Our first main theory of deviance is functionalism and the functionalist perspective, Emile Durkheim, French theorist, uh, frames the functionalist perspective. And the functionalist perspective basically, I mean, there's a lot to it. So I'm just gonna break down a couple of different things and we'll probably bring more stuff in throughout the class. But this idea, first of all, Durkheim is examining patterns of behavior, the influence of social facts, things that are external to the self. Um, the field of psychology had already been in existence. Sociology came afterwards. Durkheim focus was on taking things, or his focus was understanding the social forces. So for example, thinking about suicide, we could look at it through the lens of psychology and Durkheim said, okay, that offers, there's value in that. There's also value in looking at the social facts or the social forces outside of the individual as well. So if we see pattern, patterns of suicide in certain demographics, right, in certain ages, certain classes, people of certain racial groups, these are things that are social facts outside of the individual that are shaping the, the patterns of, of behavior. So it moves our attention, functionalism, moving to those patterns, uh, looking for the social facts, the social influences. Uh, the functionalist perspective focuses on regulation and in integration. So this focus on the more people are, have membership into a community, what is the degree of membership? Do people have a sense of belonging and connection? Um, how are people socialized into the social group and the society itself? Like those are all questions of integration. We could start thinking about gang activity, uh, certain uh, different kinds of behaviors and look at it as an issue, as an issue of integration into uh, the general culture, subcultures and, and influence. Think about regulation. So from a functionalist viewpoint, functionalist viewpoint, all societies regulate behavior. You need to regulate behavior to create a stable social order. Functionalism focuses on that stable social order. How it's accomplished is in part through integration and part through regulation. There's a view that society is built upon a value consensus in Western modern day Western worlds um, that you know we had there's constitutions. Uh, constitutions are declarations of a consensus of a consensus of values for a nation or a place. Different social groups have a different value have have a, their own value consensus. So you have a value consensus, it's an important for social organization. So the study of suicide was for Durkheim, kind of an examination of regulation and integration. People who are under-regulated or over-regulated or under-integrated, over-integrated had larger likelihood of suicide rates. We're just touching the surface, a lot of information here. It's gonna be like, whoa, this is just like going way too fast. The goal here, the theme is just to kind of provide touchdown and then in class we'll kind of continue on and things we'll get, we'll use these theories as a foundation throughout the course of the term. So this is kind of, the first week's kind of more technical stuff. The next theory is uh, social disorganization theory or social ecology. Um, the viewpoint here was really an advanced empathy. Um, this is early 1900s, came out of Chicago school. And the focus was on how are communities organized and how does community, the degree of community organization or the type of community organization influence specifically crimes. So this was like a model of crime or an examination of crime. And it kind of moved the analysis away from the sick individual to the sick society kind of thing. That there's something going on in the structure that's creating an environment where crime is more likely to happen. William Julius Wilson, uh, African-American scholar, Harvard University, sociologist, this is probably 1980s when work disappears, but his analysis of, you know, places like Chicago and Baltimore and Detroit, you have deindustrialization, jobs moving out of those sectors, unemployment goes up, poverty goes up, and coincidentally, crime goes up. And the analysis is thinking about how is the community organized? And there's a lot to that. It's not like, and there's so many factors that shape that. And his analysis or the analysis here is like how to think about all those different things that we may take for granted about community organization. 
Then there's conflict theory, another theory. Conflict theory is a model of social justice. Uh, it has a mo a, probably the model that's trying to focus on how to ensure that the, the principles of democracy are applied to everyone. So people have equal protection underneath the law. How do we ensure that, make sure that that happens for everyone? So it's a model of, of social justice in a lot of ways. We have, uh, we have different individuals kind of to signify their place in thinking about um, issues of social justice. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's just kind of the focus, right? It's, it's a sort of focus on where are the inequalities? Where's the, the distribution of power unequal and how is power being used to achieve, achieve advantage over certain groups? We could be thinking about, um, you know, the, the war on drugs, Michelle Alexander, who uh, this is a pretty popular book a while ago called the new Jim, the criminal justice policy as the new Jim Crow, um, the age of incarceration, mass incarceration and the age of colorblindness. Think about how the, the influence of race and the war on drugs, uh, put it in that political context. Um, image here of, of immigration. Um, this is the black Irish, the Chinese devouring Uncle Sam, sort of um, how sometimes policies around immigration or public fears about immigration uh, may not be the reality, um, but they, these are political tools um, that are used by politicians you know, to incite fear. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail um, later on. So, okay, conflict theory, the focus on the economic structure. So one way to think about this, I mean, the, the, I think the cleanest way is think about it in an agricultural-based society versus a society that's built around capitalism. In an agricultural-based society, what is, think about how the family operates and how the community is structured. Shift to industrial capitalism, how is the family structured and how is the community structured? Different structures, they're all being determined by or shaped significantly by the economic structure themselves. Industrial capitalism, nuclear families be more prominent. Agricultural societies, extended, fam extended family more prominent. So the Marxist analysis, it's the economic structure that creates the conditions. Crime from this perspective is related to the economic structure. So degrees of crime are related to distribution of resources, degrees of inequality, um, these kind of components. So we'll be examining that, um, this, this, you know, this is one lens that we'll look at social problems and deviance throughout the course of the term. Rather than value consensus, the conflict theory viewpoint has this view of value coercion, coercion that the public is, is coerced by force or by lack of awareness, they're, they're agreeing to things that are against their own interest. So quite a, diff view, a different viewpoint than the, than the functionalist viewpoint. Uh, the conflict theory viewpoint has a sort of viewpoint that the values represent, the dominant values of culture are the values of the, of the ruling class. And so the ruling class control ideology or beliefs, uh, those, they control or sh significantly shape institutions and they, they, they protect their interests. And ultimately the idea was for Marxist perspective is that it's important that people develop a, a move away from false consciousness. So lack of awareness to, to class consciousness, race consciousness, consciousness, gender consciousness, to become aware of how society is structured the way it is to be, so to be in a better place and better position to address social problems and issues. I'd make sure you a lot, there's a lot of long, deep historical data on the relationship between degrees of inequality and crime. The greater the inequality, the greater the violent crime rate. Um, it's not a cause effect thing though. So it's not like it's uniform across time or place, but there's a correlation there. So sometimes like, for example, good crime policy may be policy that addresses the degree of inequality. Well, to, to address inequality, you have to challenge the power structure and say that there has to be some distribution, redistribution, or more equitable distribution of resources to deal with these social problems. That's gonna be a challenge to the ruling class. So I don't know, just kind of provides an example. And then we move into the micro level, the interactionist perspective. So focus on language symbols, meaning the construction of reality. Um, we think about a violent offender, like those words themselves, where do those words come from? What are the meaning of those words? What's the, um, you know, just all kinds of different stuff that the, basically the world of, of meaning. Um, 
what gets defined as being de deviant, what's the process of defining something as being deviant, labels, the labels that we use to, to label others. I mean, that's, a, that's sort of really rich with information about the label itself and then the impact of the label on the person being labeled as well as the impact of the label on the labeler. So it's all these different kinds of things that are going on. This is an example, um, I don't know, it was a few years ago, let's see if I can remember when this year was. I wanna say it was 2018, I could be wrong about the year, but somewhere around in there, there became this smoking, vaporizing, aerosol, aerosolizing in a motor vehicle while a child was present became a, a misdemeanor criminal offense. Huh, very interesting, right? Like, okay, well, why? I think it, I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of just begs the question of a lot of meaning being attached to, um, to smoking in a car while a child is present. Culture, history, um, changing values and ideas, changing meaning, using formal systems, criminal justice system versus informal systems, social networks to regulate. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And basically that interactionist perspective takes us to this place of language, meaning, perceptions, the construction of meaning, and then thinking about the influence of labels themselves. All right, then finally, the last theme. Okay, so let me say one final comment. So when you're summarizing this theme of theories, right? Man, you, there's no way you can summarize all those different theories. Big picture, what are theories? What are they doing? What, how do they help us? And then bring some different ideas from some of those different theories that help to explain that. And then in class, we work through the theories and you get further grounded. And then by the time you walk out of class, uh, you know, hopefully you got a pretty good understanding of these theories and you can put them in your back pocket and you can use them to examine the social world. The last theme, pretty short. Uh, one way of thinking about deviance is these ABCs of deviance. Deviance isn't always behavior. So let's say I get a full head tattoo. That's behavior, right? Attitudes may be the beliefs that we have, um, the convictions that we hold. Um, to believe whether or not to be transgender is acceptable or not, um, to be have attitudes supportive of transgender. Um, different time periods that may or may not be deviant, different social circles, right? So it's not only about behavior, it's about the beliefs that we have can be deviant or normative as well as conditions. So a person has a physical disability, a person has a physical um, deformation, or you know, just there, there's a condition a person has, even mental health condition, that could be identified as being deviant. So it's not only behavior, it's these other things as well. And not all deviance is voluntary, right? So mental health becomes a good, a good example of that. Somebody has, there's, there's physiological, let's say physiological underpinnings for depression. Not all depression has those physiological underpinnings, but it could be, let's say something that there's a thyroid, actually a thyroid, a, a problem with somebody's thyroid functioning that's impacting their, their mental health. It's involuntary, but yet they're in this place of depression. Depression has, it's a label, um, it's a condition, uh, and there may be this sort of assigning a meaning of deviant status with that. I think we as a culture have changed and moved to greater acceptance of mental health, but there's still some stigma attached to it. And there's some other factors that influence whether something's deviant or not. I mentioned this before, but the status of the individual matters, race, class, gender, age, social position, as well as context, you know, physical context. I mean, is it in the office place? Is it school? Is it in a place of religious worship, uh, historical context? All these things make a difference as well. And then we think about social control. Control is basically ways of regulating. And there's re regulating that's either formal through institutions, criminal justice system. I mean, education, there's a system of control. Every institution has some regulatory mechanism that's formal. And then there's the informal, the community members, social groups, organizations, that's informal regulation. Uh, which one is more impactful for behavior? The research would say it's the informal. Um, that if you're looking for the biggest bang for the buck, it's getting people integrated into pro-social communities. And it's that pro-social behavior comes out of pro-social communities. Uh, formal social control is still important. Um, 
because you know can't only be informal. There's certain things the informal cannot do. This is going back to colonial America where things were much more informal, moving towards more formal, formal mechanisms. There's no institution of incarceration yet. So there's like the public square, right? This sort of treating and punishment via public square. This is Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, the first or model of it. This is the first modern day penitentiary in the world, happened in the United States outside of Philadelphia. Um, so now we started entering to the world in the 1800s of actually having institutions of incarceration. That's a very modern day invention. Uh, this is an image of um, convict labor uh, in the South of using inmates for convict labor. So we can talk about that at a different idea, different time. And then finally, differentiating between deviance and crime, they're not the same thing. You can think about two overlapping circles. Sometimes deviance may also be criminal. Something that's criminal may also be deviant, but they, but they are definitely separate things. So if I had a full on head tattoo, it's deviant, but it's not criminal. If I uh, go, if I'm driving between Madras and Redmond and I'm going 67 miles an hour on the highway, it's a criminal, it's a, I mean, that's a violation of the law, but it's not gonna be viewed as being deviant. So they're different uh, and it's important to keep them separate. Deviance, um, this to, you can say this with, with, with uh, crime as well, is there has to be a response from the audience. So deviance doesn't occur until there's some response from the audience itself. So a person can, uh, let's say for example, a person is engaged in drug use, but they're in their privacy of their own home and no one knows. They're away from sort of the public or from social groups. In one's mind, deviance may have occurred, have occurred right? Because they're aware of the social norms and the stigma that may be associated with that. But there's, it's called secret deviance because there's the outside world does not know. Social groups don't know. So deviance gets into the sort of like really interesting space too, that not only do we differentiate between deviance and crime, we have to start thinking about the role of the audience. And we're, we're thinking about, about deviance because deviant implies some sort of reaction, some sort of stigma um, that goes along with that. And that's, that's that. Okay, that was kind of an overview of kind of the class and everything. The last thing I want to do is to provide a little, just a little bit of information that if you're new to college, or you're kind of still trying to figure out which direction you want to go. If you find social sciences interesting, you find this class interesting, other sociology classes interesting, you're like going, but what do I do? Let me just kind of toss out some other career options and choices. Uh, sociology at a bachelor's level can take you a lot of different places. Um, a lot of human services work, working in different, you know, crim criminal justice system, behavior science, social policy. Um, can, you can continue on your work, get a master's in social work, master's in counseling, um, master's in human development. And there's a lot of different applications for, for that. One thing that, I mean, the one I try to bring up, or I think it's important to bring up because it's a clear pathway for occupation and that's public policy. So there are graduate programs, master's and PhD, OSU, Oregon State, has a public policy program. And it's basically working on public policy issues, right? So like, let's look at homelessness, uh, affordable housing, those are big social policy issues. And so you have people who are working in those fields in those areas, drawing upon all kinds of academic work and doing that sort of work of working with the state or state legislature, community organizations, and trying to deal with these particular social problems. So put that in the back burner. If you're like, oh no, that's a career choice. Never really thought about that before. Um, let me know if you want to chat about it sometime. I'd be more than happy to chat with you. Um, whether it's this term or even down the road, you're like, you remember that and you go, huh, reach out to me. I'd love to chat with that, about that stuff. Any, any information I can provide that might be helpful to you is all good. All right, have a great rest of your day. Uh, look forward to meeting you in class. Drop me an email if you have any questions. If you want to set up a Zoom meeting sometime, uh, we can do that as well. And of course, we can meet after class and, and talk about um, any questions you might have as well. All right, be safe, be well.